Okay, uh, welcome everyone to uh, the general meeting of the North Park Historical Society, the Noble Seymour Crippen House, the oldest house in Chicago. Um, my name is Bob Kelly, I'm the president. And uh, I just wanna point out that the president of the United States when this house was built was Andrew Jackson. He was the seventh president. <laughs> uh, so anyways, uh, uh, I just want to talk about a couple things uh, like past events. If if you weren't able to make them, uh, we had a yard sale this year that went all went really well um, back in June again, and uh, we had a birthday party. And we uh, this year's uh, uh, theme was uh, we had uh, Bert Mall, who's a, a expert at um, steam trains. He did a whole talk, and then we also did a a, a dog uh, adoption with uh, Right Way uh, Rescue, and uh, that was fun. And uh, and I'd like to thank everyone who donated to our annual appeal this year. Um, at this point, we've made over uh, $7,000. So we're planning on using that money to uh, uh, spruce up the North Garden and do some landscaping over there. It's uh, we haven't quite started. We started out a little bit so far. So we uh, took out some dead trees and that. So we're still in the planning stages of doing that. And uh, also uh, we've had some new exhibits in the last, uh, this last year uh, down here. Um, we're working on uh, sprucing up the living room and dining room and, and making them into uh, theme rooms for the, uh, the uh, Seymour family and the Crippen family. And then we, uh, um, getting together some period cost uh, clothing. In the back there, you see the clothing from uh, the Noble family. And uh, and at some point we'll have some for the uh, Seymour family and, and for the uh, Crippen family. And uh, also we have some uh, new exhibits in the barn. If you saw those, uh, one of them is on the Gessner dog kennels. Uh, if, if you don't know where that was at, uh, that was about six blocks from here at, uh, where uh, Higgins uh, merged with Brenmar. And uh, that place uh, was there for 61 years. And it was a, uh, a major dog training place that they trained dogs for uh, World War II and um, that kind of thing. That closed down in 1985. So, so we have a lot of artifacts from there. And then we also put up a, a uh, exhibit in the barn. It's a depiction of a sawmill uh, for when uh, this house was built and uh, we had some leftover lumber when we did the uh, reconstruction of the house. So that lumber is all from 1833. And so uh, the exhibit shows a uh, type of construction that was used at the time. So uh, try not to miss out any of those exhibits if you can make it here on Saturdays. And also uh, we're gonna, uh, our website is gonna be changed tomorrow. So uh, a new whole new look and stuff to it. So uh, if you want to make any comments on, on how you like it, that would be great. There'll be a link on the website where to comments questions. Yeah, any questions on how to use it and stuff. And then I just wanted to point out the uh, things that are usually happening here. Uh, uh, the first Friday of the month, we have game night. If you're interested in coming to a game night and play board games, a lot of people are interested in that. And there's a, a crochet knit night. It's the last Friday of the month. Uh, and then we're thinking about uh, in, thinking about a, a trivia night. So if anyone's interested in possibly a, a coming out to a trivia night, but we haven't uh, started that yet. Uh, and then the current events, uh, this Saturday is our Stems and Steins uh, wine and beer tasting event, um, which, which will have uh, a lot of, uh, um, uh, silent auction items that you can bid on and a raffle at it. Uh, Judy, Judy, would you like to say anything about it? No, just everyone should come up for it. Uh, yeah, there's still there's still still some tickets available. So it's supposed to be really nice weather on Saturday afternoon. So I hope you can come out. And then next month, uh, um, in October, we're having an indoor sale here on October 15th and 16th, uh, if you're interested in that. 
and uh, uh, and then uh, on October 19th, our next general meeting, we'll have the uh, alderman uh, um, Anthony Napolitano here. So if you uh, want to hear anything that's going on in the neighborhood, uh, you should come out. And then on uh, November 9th through 13th, uh, we're bringing back uh, Victoria's Craft Show and Holidays Cafe. So I hope uh, you can come out to that. And uh, that'll be a, a five-day event here. So a lot of Christmas uh, craft stuff to see. And uh, anyone have any questions about anything? Judy? you want to talk about Anthony's friend? Oh yeah, uh, so uh, uh, Ant Anthony Napolitano, the alderman, uh, he was um, given some money uh, to spend in the neighborhood, and so he's he's offered us uh, twenty five thousand dollars that we could use towards some improvement to the house. So uh, um, that's what he's offered us so far. So uh, and that's going to take a little while, but uh, that would be really great to be able to maybe I don't know fix a garage or do some other other improvements to the place. So uh, that's really nice that he's doing that. Um, okay, so uh, might as well get to the show. Uh, I wanna welcome back uh, Joe Geringer. He, uh, he was here uh, last year doing a um, talk on uh, Al Capone and, uh, and Elliot Ness. And uh, it's great to have him back here. So tonight's program is about uh, life on the, uh, on the uh, in the area in around the time of uh, Fort Shared, Fort Dearborn in uh, eight, around 1800. Okay, okay, let's hear it for Joe. Two hundred years ago, when America was just 18 states, the land beyond the Great Lakes offered romance, mystery, and adventure. Well, the French explored this area first, canoeing down the river Chicago, passing Little Frog Creek bubbling on what's now the grounds of the Daly Center. Now, today, what we call downtown Chicago, or the Loop, with the entire north side above it. Believe it or not, back then, that was one continuous mammoth forest. Oak trees, palm trees, or not palm trees, oak trees, pine trees, any kind of tree you could think of extending north into infinity. Um, the area was, um, actually pretty primeval at the time. Um, area was uh, named after the French, or after the, uh, the area was named after the Algonquin word, um, Chikwaga, Chikwaga, which meant wild onions, wild onions. Um, onions were profuse in this area. They grew along, especially along the Chicago River, and from what I understand, they lend quite a stink to the damp pioneer air. Populating this region were, oh, uh, a wide variety of uh, Native American tribes. Uh, the Miami, the Ojibwa, the Chickasaw, the Chippewa, the Fox, but especially the Potawatomi. Um, their wigwams decorated the rivers and the streams. And did you know this? Some of the trails that the Indians cut inland, some of those trails, they still exist today. Well, in one form or another, 
Lake Street, extending out of what's now downtown. That was an old Indian trail. So was Forest Preserve Drive, um, Milwaukee Road. Um, um, well, decade after decade, the white man and the red man lived side by side very peaceably for many years. That was never, there was never any trouble. Not until the War of 1812, which brought disaster, chaos, and uh, death. It brought the Fort Dearborn Massacre, one of the bloodiest episodes on the American frontier. Folks, I have a proposition for you. Why don't we, over the next hour or so, go back to the early 19th century to take a look at what it took for what was then called Chicago to become Chicago. I think you're going to find it oh so very interesting. And I bet you you'll be sitting on the edges of your seat by the time I'm, I'm done up here yapping. So let's try it. Let's go back to the early 1800s. Let's, um, let's work our minds, let's roll our eyeballs, uh, dream in some, some imagination, uh, let ourselves strip back. We go back further. And further, we're going back. Bingo, we are there. Well, I tried. But seriously, though, don't you wish time skipping was really, was really that easy? Because Chicago stood at the mouth of the Chicago River there on the west side of the lake, um, the young, burgeoning United States government said, oh, golly gee, what a perfect location to build an inland depot to monitor all commercial goods leaving the Great Lakes and entering the uh, Illinois frontier. Good idea, good idea. But to protect this investment, the army called in a company of soldiers out of Fort St. Joseph in the Michigan Territory to march this way and build a stockade right there at the mouth of the river. Picture, if you will, it's a bright, sunny day, July uh, 1803. Do you hear them? Don't you see them? The soldiers marching this way up the beachfront, marching this way, their flags uh, whipping and the lakeside breezes. Here they come, the fifers, the drummers, the bagpipers. <laughs> 2,000 Potawatomis who live right there along the lake rush forward, gush forward to greet the troopers and to show that they're going to be excellent neighbors what do you think they do? They help the troopers chop down trees on the north side of the river, the, uh, the woodsy section, chop the trees down, shape them, and transport them on raft across the river to the south bank, where log by log by log by log, a fort begins to take shape. 80 yards by 90 yards, Fort Dearborn, named after the then current Secretary of War, Henry M. Dearborn becomes what two years later a traveling journalist will describe as the prettiest yet most formidable frontier stockade. There it sits. There it sits in the middle of absolutely nowhere. It's two block towers overlooking the curvature of the Chicago River where it empties into the lake. To get an idea where the fort did stand, here's what you do. Next time you're downtown, kind of uh, sashay, kind of mosey over to the southwest corner of Michigan Avenue and Wacker Drive, right there, right there, right at the direct southern tip of today's Michigan Avenue bridge there at Sat. Of course, 
back then there was no Michigan Avenue, there was no uh, city. All there was was God's blue, blue sky and acres upon acres of virgin territory. But there the fort set, a strong symbol of American westward movement, a metronome of manifest destiny. Manning the fort was the first U.S. infantry dashing in their dark blue uniforms, tall black leather shako caps with a pom-pom, uh, white cross belts, and at their hips, a bayonet and a canteen. Every soldier carried a 50 caliber Springfield musket, a Harper's Ferry flintlock pistol. Um, and on the ramparts of the fort, facing out were three pieces of field artillery, cannon facing both towards the prairie and the lake. Now, muskets and cannonballs and all of this aside, there really wasn't a whole need for all of this armament. The only real dangerous enemy was old man Winter. Every November, he froze the lakefront and he promised frostbite to anybody treading too far through the shoulder high snowbanks. Now, with the coming of the American tongue, the very name of this um, area somewhat changed. Like I said, it had been called Chicago. Well, now with the Americans here, um, well, let me put it this way. If you were all living in the Ford at the time and I came along and I asked one of you, um, ma'am, ma'am, yoo-hoo, ma'am, daddy, ma'am. What do you call this godforsaken area here? You would, you would say, well, well you know, uh, you mean where we all live? Why, this is called, this is called Chicago, Chicago. And that's how, it, believe it or not, that's how this area was pronounced by the pioneers, Chicago, for some 30 years. And it wouldn't be until 1837 when uh, the city was finally incorporated, just about the time that uh, Mr. Noble built the beginnings of this house, was finally pronounced, da 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 da, Chicago. Commanding Fort Dearborn was a young gentleman in his mid 30s, Captain Nathan Heald. Captain Heald had previously commanded Fort Wayne in the Indiana Territory. But uh, when he was transferred out here to Chicago, neither he nor his wife, Rebecca, were very happy campers. I mean, they were not happy at all. Not happy at all. You see, they'd been more used to the more civilized society in eastern Indiana. They were not ready for this middle of nowhere. There's nothing. There's this remoteness. I mean, uh, nothing to do no civilization. But Captain Hill, he really should have known, even before he came here, that to the fur trappers who lived here, before the soldiers came, civilization was the last thing that they wanted. Why? Because it would have interfered with their industry. And what was their industry? Well, as agents of the American Fur Company, they traded a whole potpourri of white man's goods, buttons and baskets and brooms and bottles, things like that to the Potawatomi who lived here um, in exchange for animal furs and pelts, which when enough of those were collected, they'd be stockpiled on a flatboat and shipped down the Ohio River to such burgling meccas as Cincinnati, Cleveland, um, uh, Louisville and beyond that to Pittsburgh and Washington and New York where clothing manufacturers paid darn good money for the likes of mink, muskrat, beaver, raccoon, bear. They paid good money for these skins. So what's my point? My point is erase any previous mental imagery you may have had of these fur trappers living in some skunky little cabin somewhere. Oh no, 
Oh, no, no. These people did very, very well financially. They lived very, very comfortably. The two most successful trappers living here in 1803 when the soldiers first came were a black Santo Domingan named Jean-Baptiste du Sable. Du Sable was the first non-Native American resident in this, uh, in this area. And his French neighbor, Antoine Wilmette. Wilmette, that name sound familiar? But the most overall productive trapper was actually somebody who showed up here about a year and a half to two years after the soldiers came. His was a name we all learned in grade school, John Kinsey. John Kinsey, he showed up here around January of 1805 with his wife, Eleanor, and three kids to open up his third trading post here in the Northwest Territory. He already operated one in Kaskaskia and another one in a little, in a little burg, not, not too far from here, a little north of here called, you may have heard of it, Milwaukee. Now, John Kinsey, how can I say this? He was a very, he was a very animated character, very lively. Um, he sported a bright red beard, you know, carrot colored hair. He had a chatty personality. And when he spoke, he did so in a beautiful rolling, that's, that's hard to do, rolling Scottish brogue. Oh, the Indians love listening to Mr. Kinsey's musical lilt. They loved doing business with John Kinsey. He was a very go get him type of guy. And he was a great salesman. He not only sold items to the Indians, he also sold items to the soldiers in the fort. Items that the military didn't automatically supply. Boot black, chewing tobacco, and that just be our secret, okay? The officers weren't supposed to know about this. A little uh, fire water on the side. You know what I mean? Also, um, because several farms sprung up in the vicinity around the fort, he also saw those farming families, whatever they needed to, tin bathtubs, Dutch ovens, um, uh, uh, spinning wheels. John Kinsey could get you anything that you needed. He did business with all of the merchants up and down the rivers of Illinois. The best description of Kinsey that I ever read actually came from a friend of mine, John Yerku, who wrote, John Kinsey was the Marshall Field and the Sears Roebuck of Chicago, nigh a century before there was a Marshall Field or a Sears Roebuck. Another thing about this Kinsey, something the great schools never taught us, a little dirt, he always didn't follow the formal marketing guidelines established in Washington. He skirted a lot of government contracts by instead having merchandise smuggled in by river pirates at a much cheaper rate. And if the rumor mill is correct, he paid off the officers in the fort to, uh, to look the other way. But, you know, come on. I mean, really, you know, what, what's wrong with that? After all, come on. I mean, this is, I mean, you know, this is, uh, okay, I'll say it. This is Chicago. By 1810, the little Chicago settlement had a population of around 220. Uh, not some 90 soldiers in the garrison and the rest, uh, the rest non-combatants living in little cabins either north of the river in what's now Old Town and south of the river in what's now Bridgeport. We're talking the families, Kinsey, Lee, Corbin, Burroughs, and Rush. What do these people do? Well, they grew crops, they cut roads, they shoot horses, they made their own candles and butter and, uh, and soap. Um, men wore bark linen, slouch hats, and buckskin. 
Uh, children wore home-sewn linsey woolsey, and women wore pretty little white bonnets. And being all of a single community and a single mind, they all worshipped our one God. Occasional Jesuits from Fort Mackinac would uh, sail this way to administer the sacraments and preach the word of the Lord. But, you know, and even when the fathers were in, were in here, that uh, really didn't make a whole lot of difference because every Sunday, every Sunday at dawn, rain or shine, the whole community would meet in the little community hall inside the fort to say their prayers and sing their psalms. We are bound for the promised land. We're bound for the promised land. So who will come and walk with me as we walk to the promised land? Folks, this was the frontier. It was a very tough, very rough life. It demanded a lot of sweat, a lot of toil, sometimes a little blood. But nobody minded it. They all worked very hard to sustain a delightful little community. Um, and everybody seemed to find a little leisure in the activities of their day. Women uh, created uh, poetry clubs and um, uh, sewing circles. Men built canoes and held river races. And so everybody wouldn't be bored with each other. Captain and Becky Heald would host occasional waltzes, soirees in the fort that everybody came to. Uh, everybody came. I mean, it was something to do. For instance, on, on holidays, on holidays, everybody showed up at the fort to welcome in uh, spring breezes over Lake Michigan uh, at Easter time. And on Christmas, on Christmas, everybody brought their favorite delectable to the holiday table. They brought um, hasty pudding, sweet meats, uh, nutmeg soup. Um, and on uh, holidays, it would, but let me, let me I made some changes at the last minute. I apologize for this. Um, imagine now it's Christmas. Imagine it's Christmas. Um, sunset, Christmas Eve, 1811. Everybody inside the community hall has gathered around the little um, harpsichord inside the hall to under the uh, amber flow of the, uh, of the oil lights. And everybody is singing, away in a manger, no room for a bed, the little Lord Jesus lays down his sweet head outside a gentle snow falls tickling the landscape a steel blue under the moonlight but inside the hall oh inside the hall chubby nay fat chickens turn a magnificent oily brown in the heart filling the room with such an aroma Making myself, I'm making myself hungry here. But you know what? That brings up a good point. What did these pioneers, what did they eat on a weekly basis? Well, for one, folks, they ate a lot of, they ate a lot of fish. Don't forget they had an entire lake at their disposal. They also made pot pies stuffed with beef and venison, chicken and dumplings, oxtail soup, Johnny cakes, corn fritters, um, Farmers raised uh, uh, berries and a lot of apples. They raised chicken, beef, and swine. Children drank milk from the cows and adults, something called chicory coffee, except on special occasions, hot buttered rum. Everybody sweetened their biscuits with honey, uh, molasses, or any one of a number of spices available in John Kinsey's general store. At supper time, the little village 
wafted of the wonderful odors of bacon or roasted beef or chicken sizzling on the spit or Indian corn blackening over the open fire from just up the river, from the Potawatomi camp would often drift in the, the sedating mellowness of their campfires of dried mulberry twig and salted acorns. All right, I just brought up the Potawatomi Indians. You may be wondering, yeah, hey, Joe, what about the Indians? You haven't really mentioned anything about them. How did they and the whites get along? Wonderfully. I mean, they were two blood brothers. They, they, they got along very, very well. They hunted together and they fished together. They swam together. They played games together. They smoked the peace pipe together, a form of tobacco made from red dogwood that the Indians called kinnikinnik. And it wasn't rare that a handsome trooper and a sweet-faced Indian squaw might uh, pedaddle in the woods north of the river to the background of some babbling brook. Some of the soldiers, they married Indian women and there were grand weddings, food supplied by the women of the settlement and music provided by some of the men like John Kinsey, who bowed a darn good country fiddle. Folks, to illustrate how fraternal, how friendly this atmosphere here was. The Potawatomi Braves would just night and day, anytime, waltz into the gates of the fort. They would unchallenge. They would cross the compound and walk into the soldiers' barracks, walk into the soldiers' barracks to play games with the soldiers, games that the soldiers had taught them. I understand some of, some of them love to play uh, love to play chess. Um, sometimes the Indians would barge in to Captain Heald's private office. He didn't care. He didn't care. As long as he wasn't doing anything, he'd sit there all day and chew the fat with them. Sometimes on cold evenings, you would see some of the soldiers' wives lugging heavy iron kettles of hot soup to feed to the Indian children, um, Indian children who they uh, heard about who were sick. Um, on more temperate evenings, the people would stroll the beach, just stroll the beach. Um, man, uh, Indian, uh, whites alike, hand in hand, arm in arm, they'd stroll the beach along what's now 12th Street Beach or Oak Street Beach. The soft slush of the surf eddying around their boot heels and the moccasins. Lake Michigan, an endless mirror reflecting the gold of the moon. I mean, it must have been a very, very, very beautiful scenario. Now, the Potawatomi adored their one god, Kishe Munudo, but yet they loved hearing stories about the white man's Jesus Christ. They loved hearing about his miracles, his changing of water into wine at that wedding feast in Cana, or his raising of Lazarus from the dead. Oh, oh, and the Exodus. They always wanted to hear about the Exodus. Moses, um, Israelites escaping the mean Pharaoh through the, uh, through the Egyptian desert, especially that bit about uh, Moses and his staff parting the Red Sea. This is true. This is true. One young private recorded in his diary seeing um, about two dozen young braves meeting at the beach the day after they had heard about this parting of the Red Sea story. Bow in hand, they were trying to do the same with Lake Michigan. <laughs> Now, where the Indian village stood was exactly right where exactly where the uh, merchandise mart stands today. At the time, it was called Wolf Point. Wolf Point. It's where the Chicago River separated. Uh, uh, it still does. Where the Chicago River separates into a north 
in the South Branch. Every morning, the sentries on the wall of the forest could look out and see through the mist the hundreds of round-shaped uh, Potawatomi wigwams hugging the southern branch for miles, what today would be around Union Station to about 31st Street. Hundreds of wigwams. Now, this village on the lake was only one of others. The Potawatomi also maintained another village in present-day Lockport, one in Kankakee, and another one along the little winding Calumet River in what's now Riverdale. Occasionally, the high chiefs of all four locations would come together to meet, to ward off any growing problems or plan events. They would always meet at kind of a midway point out on the prairie, under what they called the council tree, which was a prehistoric, a huge prehistoric oak tree. Why, why am I mentioning this? Because this is going to, get ready, this is going to blow your mind. It's going to blow your mind. As Chicago grew outward, south, this council tree found itself sitting kerplunk, right in the middle of what became the Morgan Park Beverly area in somebody's backyard at 103rd and Longwood Drive. Imagine, imagine they having a relic in your backyard. I saw it. My mom, she was like me. She was a, a history nut. And I was in high school at the time. And she took me out there. We knew people who lived on that block. And I remember standing in the backyard, looking over the fence at this this Methuselah, huge, crooked, twisted, just angled at it, but beautiful, beautiful in its aspect. And it seemed to be, I remember this, it seemed to be bathed in its own waterfall of mist. It was quite something to see. I mean, if you could talk about history coming alive, if that tree would have taught. Well, I'm glad I saw it because unfortunately, it wasn't long after that that the tree had contracted some kind of a tree disease affecting all of the trees in the neighborhood and needed to be ripped apart. What a shame. What a shame. Well, the Potawatomi, they dominated Northern Illinois with a population of around 7,000. Women harvested corn potatoes, squash, pumpkins. They produced sap from trees, which they boiled down and gelled and packaged in little cloth pouches, which they gave to the white women to sweeten their dinner tables. Their braves hunted alongside the white man and they fished in the river with spears. Now, there was a point every single late afternoon, every single late afternoon, that no matter who you were, Indian or white, you would stop at what you were doing. If you were wearing a hat, you would remove it. And you would face the fort, where under a purple lakefront dusk, the stars and bars were lowered on the parade ground, on the parade ground. Accompanying this ritual, was a single bagpiper playing the hymn, Amazing Grace. <laughs> These beautiful notes pirouetting through the, through the pioneer breeze. I mean, it must have been a tranquil, moment and all seemed right with the world but all was not right with the world england jolly old england wanted desperately to reclaim lands that lost in the american revolution 30 years earlier that included 
some of the Great Lakes area. Unbeknownst to America, trained British agents were manipulating through the territory, visiting all of the respective Indian tribes, trying to get them to incite against the American army. America, they said, has been cheating you on the price of land and of furs. But if you fight at the side of King George, why, we will reward you with land and silver coins like a sackful, clink, clink. And the Indians, they listen. And if this wasn't bad enough, at the same time, we had an upstart Shawnee chief named Tecumseh with a chip on his shoulder the size of Illinois, who was going through the same area, trying to recruit disciples to fight his own war to stop American westward movement. He was a great orator. He knew the power of words. And he told his, his red race that if we don't stop the American influx, it's going to mean the uh, genocide of us red men. Like I said, he was a great speaker. Um, all the other tribes jumped on Tecumseh's bandwagon. The Miami, the Ojibwe, the Ottawa, the Sauk, the Fox, the Sioux, uh, the Chickasaw, the Chippewa. They all jumped on his bandwagon, and his words spread like wildfire across the region. They spread here to Chicago, when the old boy himself, Tecumseh, visited the Potawatomi here. But he didn't get the reception he expected. He sat down with the, he sat down with the chief of the Chicago Potawatomi, who told him right out, Tecumseh, thank you for stopping by, but I'm really not interested. We and the white man, we have lived together many years now. We love each other. We help each other. We protect each other. We intermarry. So again, thank you for coming by. But right now, I'm not interested in, uh, in ruffling the waters of warfare. Be on your way. Now, if the rest of the Potawatomi tribe felt like he did, I wouldn't be here today talking about a Fort Dearborn massacre. However, unfortunately, some of the young braves were, to quote an old axiom, bored out of their gourd. They'd been listening to all of the other local tribes bragging about the warfare, fighting, thrills and chills, glory. And what was the part of Watermy doing here? They were hunting and fishing. Hunting and fishing, hunting and oh, hunting, oh, hunting and fishing. They wanted more. They wanted much more. And they started listening to Tecumseh, who was telling them, we must drive the Kamaknanuk, the American invader, off of our prairies, out of our waters. And we must do it on an altar of blood to be sure that they never, ever come back. Oh, they were mean words. Oh, they were mean, 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 mean words. And they reverberated all the way to Washington, where President James Madison was hearing them. And he panicked. He told his cabinet, gentlemen, if we don't stop this insanity now, we're going to lose all of our Western possessions. He declared war against Mother Britain and against any red ally who sided with Britain. At the same time, Congress issued a writ forbidding further sale of alcohol and armament to the Indians. Well, when the Potawatomis got wind of this, they were angry. They were beside themselves. They had remained very loyal to the whites. And now they were telling Captain Hield, whoa, whoa, wait a minute here. We've been for you guys. We have been friends. We've done everything you've asked. We, 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 we played together. 
And now you're telling us we can't have this. We can't buy this. Why? What have we done to be mistreated so? Dark things began to happen. One morning in uh, February of 1812, a group of uh, soldiers were out hunting, as they did every morning. They came across the Thomas Burns farm, which spread right along where Archer and Halston intersect today, right there. On the farm, they found a dozen of the farmhands decapitated. Captain Hill, he ran over to the Potawatomi camp and he asked them, could somebody tell me what happened out there? I mean, does anybody know about this? Oh, the Potawatomi, oh, they, they were, you know, hurt. They, they you know, mumbled and they, they looked at Captain Hill and I, we don't know nothing about that. Don't ask us, we don't know nothing. But the settlers weren't buying it. And the reason they weren't buying it is because they had seen over the last couple of months, the size of the Potawatomi village literally expanding outward. As Potawatomis from all of the other villages were drifting in 70, 80, 90 at a time, bringing with them Winnebago, Win uh, members of the Winnebago tribe who were known white haters. And something else was happening too. And it's never happened before. It seemed that no matter what time you were talking, three in the afternoon, three uh, uh, in, the, in the morning, midnight, noon, there always seemed to be, there always seemed to be about 200, 300 braves just hanging out around the gates of the fort. And that bothered everybody. It's not that they were really doing anything, but it was their attitude. What used to be magnificently friendly had decayed to, well, let's quote what John Kinsey later wrote. He wrote, if belligerents were an ax, you could have used that attitude to cut your way to the bowels of hell. And in the meantime, the sounds of war were closing in on Fort Dearborn. On August 9th, 1812, Captain Heald received the following dispatch from Frontier Headquarters in Detroit. It read, sir, it is with great regret that I order the evacuation of your troops at Fort Dearborn and your removal to Fort Wayne in the Indiana Territory. Destroy all arms that you cannot take with you, but you can give all leftover goods to any friendly Indians who may be desirous of escorting you through Indiana to Fort Wayne. Go with God, General William Hull, commanding. Ladies and gentlemen, I held that letter. I held that letter, not a facsimile, I held that letter in my hand in a plastic sheeting. I knew people who worked at the museum downtown. And holding that letter, knowing as a historian and writer, what was going to happen in less than a week after Captain Hale received that letter, I'm telling you, I felt an electric shock up my arm, like you couldn't believe. Well, as time drew near to evacuate the fort, everybody, soldiers and settlers, were naturally very apprehensive. They were asking Captain Hill, wait a minute. Does this mean we're going to be walking out to an array of angry tomahawks? Captain Hill's own second in command, Lieutenant Lanai Helm, he conceded that to march out might be a disaster. He pleaded with Captain Hill. He said, sir, we have enough armaments and uh, supplies to maintain a four month siege. We have 6,000 pounds of, 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 of uh, gunpowder. We have three working canning. We have 400 cattle in the corral. 
John Kinsey agreed. He told Captain Hale to remark that. My gut's telling me that it's going to be suicide. On the evening of August 14th, the night before the evacuation, friendly Chief Black Partridge visited Captain Hale and his officers in the fort. And he told them straight out, don't, don't march out tomorrow. I can no longer control my young braves. They want to taste your blood. The death birds, he said, are warbling in the field. Do not walk out. And then, believe it or not, Captain Hill made a number of ridiculously naive decisions. First of all, he told his men, I don't want to hear any more of this nonsense. Nothing's going to happen. We're ready to go. We're going. Two, he destroyed the three cannon. Three, a couple of days earlier, he had told the Potawatomi that they could have all leftover supplies in the fort, clothing, food, medicine. And for some reason, several barrels of muskets and gunpowder. Well, he may have had second thoughts on that last item because the night before they left, he had his soldiers dump the muskets and the gunpowder into the Chicago River, greatly setting off the Indians. Today, historians all agree that even though his intentions may have been honorable, it's the worst thing he could have done, the worst thing. Winter was coming. And historians all agree that the Potawatomi probably very appreciated getting those muskets to help expedite their hunting process to better feed and clothe their families. Um, one historian, John Chauncey, wrote that getting those muskets would have probably um, softened any dark motivation that there wouldn't have been a massacre. Well, that night, after watching Captain Heald's promise literally go into the river, they held a war dance in their, in their uh, camp all night long, all night long, pounding, pounding, every minute pounding, every second pounding, yelping, whining, screaming, yelping, screaming, screaming, guns going off, screaming all night long until sunrise. Nobody slept that night in Fort Dearborn. With the first glimmer of dawn, the sentries on the wall of the fort realized that in the darkness, about, 30, uh, about 300 Potawatomi had assembled outside the fort. They, were, they said they were there to act as um, escorts to Fort Wayne, but something didn't match. They all held on to weapons. They flourished in war paint. Um, 9 a.m., the gates sprung open and out marched about 200 very, very frightened people. The soldiers had already fastened their bayonets to their guns. The bandmaster, uh, Bob Lionel, accepting his fate, had his musicians play Handel's Death March. Right outside the gate, right outside the gate, the entourage turned a direct south. On their left was Lake Michigan. On their right were sand dunes, some of them rising 20 feet high, so high that you couldn't see what was going on on the plains above. And that topography would prove to be lethal. Probably 
excuse me, probably the smartest person on the beach that morning was John Kinsey. For he put his wife and children in a skiff 30 yards out on the boat. They would follow the procession as it moved south along the beach. Leading the procession was Captain Hield on horseback behind him, his marching infantry behind them, the women and the children, some on foot, some in Conestoga wagons. In the rear was a small militia of civilians, men who wanted to be near their families in case of trouble. The route they took was what today would be South Michigan Avenue to Roosevelt Road. Roosevelt Road over to Prairie Avenue at Prairie Avenue South. At what today is South 18th Street and Prairie Avenue, Captain Heald called a halt under a hot August morning sun. He glanced at his watch. It was uh, 1045. And he was wondering why the Potomotomy escort was suddenly laughing, dancing, cajoling, singing. He wondered what's all this about? Well, he didn't have to wait long Suddenly, over the crest of the sand dunes, poured about 1,500 Potawatomi and Winnebago, all carrying tomahawks, all crying in their language, death to the white man. A bugle blew, blew a bugle blew. Captain Hill draw his sword. He yelled, charge, and his men, bayonet out front, charged the sand dunes. Uh, the Indians momentarily uh, parted. But over, over leading the, the sides of the whites, they quickly regrouped and they pushed the army into the lake, cutting them off from the women and the children. The women and the children, now totally defenseless, fell prey to the savagery. Indians, they crawled into the back of wagons, they beat the little children to death with their war clubs in front of their mothers. They pulled their mothers out onto the sand, raped them, and cut their hearts out. Um, there's a lot more I can tell you, but I think you got the idea. In the meantime, poor Black Partridge was running through his own men, crying, please, no more, no more killing, please, please. Somehow he, he happened to procure a ceasefire. He brought a very badly wounded Captain Hill to meet with his uh, tribal chieftains. Um, seeing that his army was gone and that the beach literally writhed with dying women and children, he surrendered his sword, his sword under the promise that nobody else would be hurt. The Indians promised. Oh yeah, they promised until they got the survivors back to the camp. There they roasted officers over fires. They made the women run the gamut of braves as they beat them over the head with rocks. One young girl, 14 years old, whose crying was getting on, a, on an Indian's nerves, he tied her to a tree as food that night for the wild animals. Those who were still alive the Hills, the Kinseys, and several others, they were sold off to British forts along the Great Lakes. Three years later, at the end of the war, which America won, they were returned to federal forces. Now, America had won the war. Those Indians back in Chicago, who had caused most of the trouble, they ran for the hills, knowing America verbally wanted revenge. They ran and they ran, but they couldn't run. They couldn't run far enough. Unfortunately, America was just a little too hot under its collar. They came across any Indian village 
even though they had nothing to do with the massacre. They were Indians, that's all that mattered. They just shot anything that looked like an Indian dead. And that, and that was terrible too. Um, finally, um, those who were still alive made it back home alive. Now, the Indians never returned to Chicago, but John Kinsey did. He resumed his mercantile trade and he grew up at the beginnings of the city. He was called the grandfather of Chicago and he saw Chicago sprout along the lakefront. Um, the military, they came back too. They built a second Fort Dearborn over the remains of the first. The Indians had burnt it. Um, it remained there. The second Fort Dearborn remained there uh, pretty much until an early evening in October 1871 when the Chicago fire ruined and burnt the rest of it. Now, the Potawatomi, having been all round, having been all rounded up, were eventually brought to what's now Oklahoma to a reservation. The night before they left Chicago, they bid farewell to the plains that they loved so much. They danced on the same grounds where they had danced the war dance. Now it's been said, I don't know if you believe in this sort of thing or not, but it's been said by some very credible people, the mayor and his assistants, for one, who had heard it, they claimed that in the dead of night, you could hear the pom-poms pounding and the soft cry of the Indians' whoops riding the wind. Anyway, I don't know who exactly did it or when, but somebody along the way happened to uh, retrieve a few logs from the original Fort Dearborn. And they stand today in the History Museum downtown. And every time, every time I walk by them, I want to run my fingers across their surface. And I think to myself, if only these logs could talk. In closing, let me say this, that in September of 1900, an 89-year-old lady, Susan Simmons, the last surviving member of the Fort Dearborn colony, died in far off San Francisco. She wore a scar on her, on her head where, as a baby, a uh, tomahawk had deflected off of a tree and hit her right here. That scar remained. She wore it for the rest of her life in honor of the fellow Chicagoans who died that she might live. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Any questions? I'm a little hard of hearing, so. How did the Indians and the white people communicate if they didn't know each other's language? Um, there, actually, there was a, a, a couple Indian interpreters who lived on, uh, who lived on, which was called the Agency House, which was where a lot of the goods were sold back and forth. And John Kinsey himself knew the language. Oh. So how did, how did it come about? How did he learn it? He I, a, how did Kinsey learn the language? He didn't live with them, did he? Well, he lived in the, he was raised by the Indians. I don't think the Potawatomi, but he was raised. Um, as a child, his home had been attacked. I think his parents were killed. Don't quote me on that. But he grew up with the Indians. Oh, okay. uh, any other? Thank you. Well, no. Uh, Mark Noble, who built the original part of this house, uh, lived with Right, so that's the linkage between this house and the Kinsey's. Okay. What part of this house was the original? You're right, you're right. Okay. You're right, this, um, that was the summer kitchen. 
Sue Helm here. Uh, okay, so this this space that we're in is the original house from the wall you're looking at back there, and the entire footprint. Of this part of the house is the original house. And upstairs. And right up to the. Yeah. This place is beautiful, by the way. Beautiful. So when Mark Noble came from England, he lived with the Kinsey, right? Yeah. Well, he lived in the Kinsey house. So the Kinsey's, okay, so Java built the house, and later the Kinsey's lived in the house, and then the Kinsey's apparently rented the house to the Nobles. And so they wow. were in that house between 1831 and 1833 when this house was built. And the location of that is essentially where the Apple store is right now on the Chicago Mm -hmm. Street. Got a question, Sharon? I thought you did. (laughs) Thank you. Oh. Yeah, just a question about the lake, the lakefront. North of the Chicago River, where would the shoreline have been during those? Evening, daytime. I'm sorry, what was that? The shoreline north of the river. Yes. Where is it in relation? Where would the been in relation to where? Okay. Um, it's about where Wabash Avenue is now. Um, you may know this, the rest was built up with bricks after the Chicago fire. They needed somewhere to put everything. So they dumped it into the river, and thus the thus the shoreline was, you know, elongated. But yeah, the the at the time, if you would ever see a map of Fort Dearborn, it was sitting right in a loop of the river. That loop was eventually straightened, so where Fort Dearborn actually stood it was actually. Partly on, well, like I said, at the corner of um, Michigan Avenue and Wacker Drive, but part of it would have also been in the in the drop of the river. Uh, These are bronze markers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I've seen the pavement markers there. Yeah, where the fork was. Yeah. 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 If you go down to approximately 18th and Prairie, which was kind of like the, the Gold Coast, the very wealthy bit. Um, if you, you know, 18th, all that is a lot of land. So if you go to <clears throat> that was all late in, in 18. Well, well, you'd have to pay for the battle for your department. Mm-hmm. We have to come all the way up to practically for the railroad track center, uh, just east of the park. Mm-hmm. That's where it dropped off. Mm-hmm. So the battle probably, you know, a mile distance, probably extended because the battle wasn't in a concentrated area. Probably extended from the Michigan Avenue down to where the railroad track. Mm-hmm. So you'd have to you know, use a lot of imagination to forget all the land going east from there that we didn't exist. Huh. Well, thank you, everybody. Huh. When did, when did Kinsey open his steakhouse? I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Right after <laughs> It's good. It's got good steak. Can't create a lot of holes. <laughs> I wish to this day I talked about that tree. I wish to this, I don't know what why I didn't at the time, but I would have loved to have grabbed a piece of that tree. Well, of course, I didn't know that it was going to be cut down. Uh, what happens, you know what happens while the wood in the tree? When, the tree, when the tree was cut up, did people. It was, yeah, it pretty much filled up the yard. I mean, did people save pieces of this as a start or not? Just no, no. Yeah. But it, it went through my mom's mind. <laughs> I think she was afraid somebody would say something. Yeah, yeah. What, what about Billy Caldwell? Okay. Billy Caldwell was he at this time? The time you were talking about tonight? That's that when he lived. Billy Caldwell. Yeah. Back to the head. My ears back. Billy Caldwell. 
Was Billy Caldwell alive at the time? Yeah, the he was very much responsible for keeping John Kinsey alive and Captain Hale and the officers because they were they were destined for the Indian camp to be killed. And Billy Caldwell, he, you know, he he held a lot of weight. He they they he what he did is he talked the Indians into letting Kinsey healed um, and a couple others, L Lieutenant Helm, letting them go for the night to stay in the Kinsey house. And he said, I'll watch them. I'll be sure they don't get away. I think we need to think about what we're going to do. You know, when he knew Don well, he was going to let them go. So they said several of the uh, Potawatomi sat outside that night with guns, uh, with, the, with the direction that don't let anybody hurt these people. And by the morning came, um, I think it was called while well, they talked talk the, the, uh, the Indians into letting them go. Well, you know, we're going we're gonna to bring them to the British force and they'll be mistreated there. They'll, they'll get theirs. And once outside the city, he brought them to uh, Detroit, which was then still under American control. And they were... Uh, uh, and they were they were pretty lucky. One thing that I and this is not a political thing, but I got into a fight one day uh, with some government uh, personage who I happened to mention just briefly passing. I don't know why they named the park um, the Battle of Fort Dearborn Park. Shouldn't it be a massacre? Oh, I, I got hit with all kinds of charges. And I said, my grandma, look, to rush into the backs of wagons, kill young defenseless children, rape women, cut their hearts off. If, if I, I'm Irish, if I found out that an Irish group did something like that, I'd have to admit, look, that's a massacre, you know. Uh, but it was a it was a, a really interesting time to live, and you know, too bad that it wound up being so hostile. Uh, anybody else? Whatever happened then to the, uh, the chief of the Potawatomi who tried to save him? What what eventually happened to him? Excuse me. I'm sorry, sir. What eventually happened? to the chief of the Potawatomi, Potawatomi oh, who was trying to save him. That's the story in itself. Um, the, 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 the village, I can't remember which one exactly. Um, yeah, I do. It was Peoria. His family lived in Peoria. And that was one of the, the, the villages that the American forces swept through and you know, they were not even involved in the massacre, but everybody there was killed. And um, he was so bitter that he spent the rest of the war fighting on the side of Britain. Yeah. He lost his entire family. And to come, so what happened to him? He was killed, you know, I don't remember. I, can't remember. I know he was killed. Uh, during the... Uh... Huh. Yeah. All right. I read that the uh, bodies of the people were left there for a couple of years. Yeah. Um, by the way, I have a handout uh, up there. Bring one home. It uh, was taken from... Um, a site called huh, Historical Hauntings or something. Um, there was construction along the Lake Michigan. And they came across these bones in a swatch of land between Indiana Avenue and uh, um, the lake around 12th Street, no, about 18th Street. And at first, Everybody thought they were from a, a, a cholera epidemic that hit Chicago in the 1840s. They scientifically tested the bones 
And they said, no, these are, these are from a lot earlier, around the, around the 1800s. And that's when they said, these have got to be victims of the, of the, uh, of the massacre. And this is, this is not my imagination. It's documented. Um, those bones were given a proper burial. They say within a couple of weeks, figures wearing old time military uniforms and women silently running through the area, screaming, of course, you couldn't hear any sound. Um, bus drivers who were returning their buses in the middle of the night to the CTA garage right there, they came forth and they said, we're not making this up. We've seen, we've seen it. So that's, there's been no sightings since then, but yeah. And they were, they were, when the, when the fourth, when the when soldiers came back at the end of the war, the bones were still there, you know, just died under the sun, yeah. Where was this burial? Where they buried all the bones? Pardon? Where was the burial that you're just talking about? Um, you know what? That's a good question. Yeah, that's a good. I wanted to say, I wanted to say in the old um, Fort Dearborn Cemetery, which was, which was right around where Dearborn, I think Dearborn and, and LaSalle is now. Um, Fort Dearborn had its own fort. But that wouldn't have made sense because, yeah, yeah. But I don't know. Well, there was a big cemetery at North Avenue. What's that? There was a big cemetery at North Avenue nearby. Yeah, yeah. Now, John Kinsey, he's still here. He's buried in, and I can never think of the name of the cemetery. One of the biggies up here. That's it. Yeah. He's still here. Right, uh, okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.